Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Geo Women panel. We have five amazing women with us today from various disciplines in geospatial. It will be an interesting session where we can learn about their experiences in career development and how they got to where they are today. On this panel, we have Dr. Nadine Alame, CEO of Open Geospatial Consortium, Aditi Kohli, Managing Director of Foursquare Asia Pacific, Dr. Latsmi N. Goparaju, Scientific Advisor VN Heshaf, India, and Regional Ambassador for Women in Geospatial Plus Asia, Jennifer Choi, Head of Product Partnerships Geo at Grab, and Shiori Kimura, Customer Solutions Engineer from Sysperspective Japan, a Geoworks Geotech as well. Welcome, ladies. I'll get the ladies to intro themselves with the starter questions. For Nadine, Laksmi, and Shiori, three of you share some commonalities. Um, you wanted to be lecturers at some stage in your life, but somehow you pivoted to where you are today. Can you share with us about your career aspirations and looking back um, to where you were and now, how did you get to your current position? Maybe Dr. Nadine, you would like to start? Um, sure. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Loud and clear. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Vanessa, for organizing this and for inviting me. Um, and joining you from Washington, D.C., exactly midnight. And uh, yes, so initially, actually, um, I wanted to be a professor. So that's a good start because I come from a family of professors. Um, uh, but then I quickly found out two things. One, I get bored very quickly and I need fresh material all the time. And two, I really don't have the patience that you need to be teaching somebody else. So um, that's how I gravitated towards geospatial. The applications are limitless. The technologies, uh, you see it today, they're modernizing, disrupting. Uh, the innovation is everywhere. I actually joke that if you want to pick a field, if you're a younger professional and you want to pick a field, but you're not into commitment, geospatial is a great field because you know you can do anything. And uh, with respect to my journey, I think uh, it's a combination of uh, go with the flow and jump at the opportunity. So I was a computer engineer. I got into GIS because I was selected for a scholarship to go to MIT. And I said yes to MIT. I didn't know what GIS was, but, was, but MIT, I'll go. And GIS, from there, um, you know the rest. It opened the world to me. And I was early on interested in how to use geospatial data with other data. So that's why I gravitated towards interoperability and standards. And now I'm at OGC. And even though the journey, um, uh, through the journey, sometimes I said, I want to try something not geospatial. So I started an aviation uh, you know, business, a startup. And it turns out that aviation was also all geospatial because it's airport maps and airspace configurations and the weather, it's all geospatial. So, so it looks yes. like you were not able to run away from geospatial. It keeps coming back to you. Exactly. So when they say uh, geospatial is everywhere, I think I, I experienced it. And that's how I got here. Everywhere you turn, you end up in geospatial. And that's why I'm here. Thank you, and Dr. Nadine, for the wonderful intro. Well, we move now to Dr. Laksmi. Would you like to share your experiences? Yes. Hello. A very good morning to all of you. I'm joining you from Riyadh, KSA. It's very uh, early morning, uh, 7 a.m. So um, uh, I was also a life science student studying botany at University of Allahabad. So uh, after that, I wanted to do PhD. So in pursuit of that, when I was looking, I got the uh, advertisement from ISRO and that uh, research scholars are needed. So after that, uh, I filled in the form and I was selected for a project. And till that time, I didn't knew anything about remote sensing and GIS. So while completing that project only, I learned informally from senior scientists there. And I, as, as, as much as I learned, I felt in love with that uh, science. And it is this is one a branch which integrates all other branches. Like earlier, I didn't knew that life science would be uh, of some use in uh, satellite remote sensing or GIS. Then I, I had a background in what, the, what uh, it would be. But when I discovered all those things, it was really interesting and uh, worth exploring it. Till now, I'm exploring. 
uh, new techniques how to study forest biodiversity and how to protect wildlife using this geospatial technology so till uh, so far it's been quite interesting and i think further also i'll explore more and more thank you very much dr laxmi it looks like um Geospatial brings together many people who have a high level of curiosity to learn about new possibilities of uh, technologies and what use cases that are there out there in the industry. So now let's move on to Shuri Kumura from Synspective Japan. Would you like to unmute yourself, please, Shuri? So sorry. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining this session. I'm Shiori from Japan at 1 p.m. here. And I'm a customer solutions engineer at Synspective. Um, I use Earth observation satellite data to understand the ground surface and propose specific solutions to customers by connecting customers' requests and needs with our capabilities. Um, my, yeah, I'm very happy to talk with such wonderful ladies today. Um, my career started in data analysis, and then I had an opportunity to be a lecturer in skill development and contribute to sales activities now. Uh, I was interested in environmental problems and sustainable development at university, and the remote sensing is one of the ways to get involved in the issues. And I thought it's useful to assess the situation objectively with the data for decision making and learn about satellite solutions. So that was the beginning of my career in geospatial. After the graduation, I joined an area survey company to utilize my skills and, and could develop the expertise. Through the project, I had a chance to be a lecturer in skill development training of satellite data and came to think I, I want to share the geospatial solutions capabilities to address customers' challenges, yeah, people's challenges. And after yeah, I quit the Polybius company, I left this industry for two years, but returned by chance. And now I I work for Synspective now. I could enhance my responsibilities to yeah, conduct sales activities and so this development based on my experiences. Sometimes I face difficulties, but um, I don't know what's next, but I'm enjoying this journey. Thank you, Thank Shuri. You. Um, can you share with us as well, how was the experience like transitioning from an educational background um, and a career into working with a startup? Um, I, I joined this company at very early stage, so not only technical roles, I I need to work like for March tasks. Mm, so I I could utilize my experiences as a lecturer, yeah, to talk with customers. Thank you very much. So we'd like to welcome and introduce as well Jennifer Choi from Grab and Aditi Kohli from Foursquare. So questions to you both ladies. Um, how was it like moving from one industry to another for you and the learnings and opportunities? Jennifer, would you like to start or Aditi? Yes, Aditi. Sure. You were, you're from the media industry, Aditi, and you moved on to uh, working for Foursquare. Sure. So thank you, Vanessa, firstly, thank you so much for having me on this panel with such esteemed, educated, complete rock star women in the geospatial industry. Uh, I'm Aditi, based in Singapore. I run the business of Foursquare. What we actually do at Foursquare is we are a leading location intelligence platform whereby, you know, it's for accessing robust and precise location data to solve various use cases. Uh, in cases, you know, our product suite in Asia covers up meeting up people with uh, from the CPOs or from the CMOs or from the chief digital officers organization, whereby, you know, we offer best in class solutions in from a targeting or a measurement point of view, which is more towards the marketing, geo marketing location data, 
and obviously from an analytics point of view. So, you know, these are just to name a few as to what we are doing in Asia. Prior to joining Foursquare, I spent 15 years of my life working for big media and entertainment companies, uh, CNN, Disney, MTV, all out of Asia where I was fairly instrumental in building up their uh, digital business when it started to kind of really catch up on fire since 2007. And um, obviously, while I was doing this, uh, you understand that business well. Asia, of course, is a disparate set of market. But along the way, I started to realize that there is a very keen need of data, especially when smartphones started coming in. And, you know, we started to get a lot of data points in. And what do we do with this data? To understand your customer or understand your consumer even more became more and more critical, which every year passing by because of all these data sets that were available. I would just say I was very fascinated um, I came from a business background. I did my MBA. Incidentally, obviously, I had done geography honors. So it seems like, you know, whatever goes by comes by in form of a lat long in my life. Um, and I started to read up a lot about geo and, you know, in terms of how location can really benefit from a business perspective, growing uh, the growth of several industries and solving the real world challenges. Uh, and that's when I got fairly you know, interested in working for a startup in the location space, whereby we were solving problems like where should a particular brand or a logo put up their next store? Or where should an advertiser be specifically marketing to its audience? So understanding the people aspect and the places aspect and really co-joining them um, is, is what I have been doing since past several years. And that's how my, my career trajectory has grown. Uh, in terms of uh, you know, in terms of just the learnings that I've had, obviously working for you know sizable MNCs, it's very some it's very much like business comes to you, right? And you're just building up or just giving away what you already have. When you come into a startup or when you come into a data and a location space earlier on in the day, it was all about you going out and educating the market of what the value a location data set can bring to a specific customer. And I think that was an amazing journey and it still continues. I think Asia is a, is a place for growth. Um, everybody is investing into analytics. Over 70% of companies in the next two years want to invest in there. They really, really want to understand their customer better. And I think something like this like totally, totally excites me. So that's that's been my transitional journey from uh, an MNC non-location world to now uh, being several years in the in the data or I would say in the location intelligence space. Thank you, and we are very pleased to have Foursquare as a geo partner at GeoWorks and also a partner for our one map um, platform. Over to you, Johnny. For moving on from the business hat that RDT is wearing to a product hat, would you like to share your experiences and learnings as well? Sure. Thank you so much again for having me on the panel. I'm really excited again. Um, just feel so honored to be with uh, such a wonderful group of women uh, in the geospace. I think it's just fantastic. I hope it really inspires more women to come into the space as well. Um, so for me, I work, I'm, I'm based in Singapore and I work for Grab, which is Southeast Asia's um, super app. And we're in the transportation space, we're in the delivery space. And so obviously, um, at the core underlying technology is is really based on our maps and, and based on, on geo and so um, that's how i first got introduced and excited about the geospatial space is, uh, when i started leading um, product strategy and when the opportunity uh, opened up for me to um, lead the product partnerships and program management team at grab um, i jumped up the opportunity because it really is uh, to me geo is the tip of the spear when it comes to all technological innovation at, at Grab. And so that's what I was really excited about. Um, I actually don't have a geospatial background. And, um, and so for me, this was a transition, but um, I think I would say for those that are in, that are thinking about transitioning or, or if you know um, others that are new to space, that what is the best way to help them? What's been helpful for me has been really immersing myself with um, a great team um, and then secondly, really getting close to the customer. And so I'm a really big believer in uh, product immersions and um, being with the end user. And so I remember uh, one of my first roles was to go to Indonesia and to be with drivers 
um, two, uh, two wheel drivers, uh, those that are riding the motorbikes. And I would spend, I think I started from like 4 a.m. to about 10 p.m. Uh, follow the drivers and really experience um, the pain of um, what it's like to na uh, navigate um, d just traffic in Jakarta. It's different from what you see and from the reports to experiencing the firsthand. And so um, understanding what, what, what's, what makes it so difficult to, for a specific POI, what are the challenges? Where do I find parking? Um, how does this help me um, get a better, better, faster delivery? How do, how do I keep it safe? What are those concerns? So the pro putting the product hat, hat on, um, I think it's really been important for me to get on the ground. And um, it's just the context, whenever I'm thinking about making decisions uh, in the geospatial um, uh, function, I still keep in mind the, the end user. And so that's what my advice would be to anybody that's thinking about transitioning. Immerse yourself in the space uh, and get to know your end, end customers. Thank you, Jennifer. We're also very happy to have Grab as a geo partner. And I can attest that working with the Grab team is just always um, amazing. Um, and they've been very supportive of our industry programs as well. So we shall now move on to the next um, section um, about discussing of the pipeline of women in geospatial. How does it currently look like? I would like to invite uh, Dr. Laxmi to present uh, her slides on um, about the Women in Geospatial program, which she is representing for Asia. Dr. Laxmi, please. I hope you can see the slides. Yes. Yes, uh, I'll talk about Women in Geospatial Plus, which is a community uh, uh, group uh, presently uh, getting uh, registered in UK. So our mission in Women in Geospatial Plus is to build an inclusive global community, uniting, inspiring, and empowering all women plus in geospatial sector to become stakeholders and change makers. So we offer advocacy, community building, events, mentoring, and speaker database. Uh, we have a wonderful uh, speaker database through which we allow our uh, members to represent women in Geospatial Plus at conferences. So right now, we have 316 registrations. In advocacy, we share the weekly profiles of our members so to inspire them and encourage them. We have this uh, mentorship program, which is the annual mentorship program. It aims to bring people together and grow and develop professional skills for a geospatial career. All are welcome, women plus, including non-binary and individuals from all underrepresented communities can be a mentor or mentee. We also welcome cis men to be a mentor. We had supported 42 people in 2019 and more than 100 people in 2020. So now we are growing in 2021. The registration is open now till September 19, and we will have a new cohort by, the, by October. So this uh, was the cohort of last year, 2020 where we had mentor and mentees, uh, all, all of them in a wonderful group. And this is about a regional group of Asia, Geosaki, which is an online learning platform and community for geospatial women enthusiasts. So with this aim in mind, we had conducted a masterclass about which I'll talk in August uh, last month. And we had more than 500 registrations from 33 countries. Students, early career professionals were interested. 96% were female participation. And more than 97% had said that they improved their technical knowledge after the master class. So we conducted this in collaboration with African Women in GIS and Geo Ladies Philippines. And we had some of the latest uh, trending topics of geospatial covered in this. And it, it was for six days and it was a wonderful thing and many had liked it and we had 
a good response, which I didn't expect much. Uh, so this means that uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, early career or students, they are interested, but they hardly get any resources, mostly uh, free resources or something to learn about. So uh, according to their feedback, that is what I came to know that uh, they do want to learn uh, the new things, but they are not able to. Thank you. Uh, you can find me at this place. Thank you, Lakshmi. This looks very um, inspirational. That, and um, we would love to hear and see more um, programs held in Asia as well, and perhaps at next year's SDG Fest. And men in the audience, um, they are also seeking mentors uh, from uh, different uh, genders. So yeah, you can uh, send your emails to Lakshmi as well. Yeah. Um, and you can share the maybe the URL of your organization in the, in the chat box yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, after sure. this um, call. Okay. So uh, we would like to also invite um, Dr. Nadine to share her comments about uh, the pipeline of women in geospatial. Um, do you have any other inputs or thoughts you'd like to share? Um, first, my my quick reaction to what I just, what I just heard from uh, Dr. Lexmi. Thank you. Uh, thank you for doing this. Thank you for the whole Women in Geospatial Plus movement for the awareness and the support. Um, and I just like, you know, as uh, Dr. Lexmi was going through the slides, I'm like, I wish you were here when I first started because, you know, um, it's a gap. It's really a gap. I recall moving to Washington, D.C., not knowing anybody and uh it felt like everywhere i went at work it was all men and even when i tried to you know create a professional network so i joined organizations professional societies like ieee and they were still all men so you know it's it's great to see that we're trying to build this network i think we've come a long way i've encountered uh, you know, I think similar issues when I was, as I mentioned earlier, in the aviation industry, which was, you know, so women in tech are rare still. Women in aviation, it's still a very male dominated industry, but we worked very hard. So when you usually, when there's a little group of women anywhere, we bond together and then we create a movement. And I think Women in Geospatial Plus is a great example. Um, you mentioned, Vanessa, about the pipeline. Um, I'll be honest with you, I don't see this, you know, huge pipeline coming at me yet. Uh, and I can tell uh, when we put out a new position for a job at OGC, for example, and right. we get one or two maybe women applicants, seriously. Um, and I, if we don't actually put the effort to recruit women and minorities, right, they're not lining up yet, right? So there's still something that is off. It's, it's still something that we need to support. Um, same thing when we have our events, right? I think now there's a whole movement of ensuring that there are as many women representatives on panels and events. But again, it's still a very conscious effort to get to, you know, a gender balanced, you know, event overall. Um, and uh, which means we still need to keep at it until the time comes where it's just, it happens on its own, right? Because that's the pool, it's already there. So I think we're, I like that we're all making the effort. I'm trying, uh, I, I know I'm not doing enough, but I'm trying, uh, I hope you saw it yesterday because we're co-hosting the OGC uh, member meeting this week. So I'm trying at least for the opening and closing plenaries to showcase uh, women leaders, right, in this, in our space, so that at least there's an inspiration and there's a contact, right, for this new generation, because we need role models. And so hopefully we're doing a little bit and it's our combined efforts that eventually will get us where we're not having to think about it every, literally every day as we're looking at opportunities, projects or events. Does that really help? Or... Yes, Lakshmi, you have some thoughts to add? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Nadine. You are also welcome on board next time for the masterclass. And we also need support from uh, women in geo 
geo special woman like you and uh, it was a very uh, you know I, i just created ripples among the younger generation so i hope to connect more and more as i go by this journey of a re, as a regional ambassador so i hope to connect more countries and uh, you must be wondering there are very remote countries you know where nothing is available so uh, with this thing you know i have tried to connect people from very remote countries also so i hope uh, to bring everyone on board and sail through the same boat thank you so much thank you really thanks last me can you share a bit more about uh, what are the current um, focus for women just special in asia what programs would you foresee be coming up in the next few months and which countries in particular that you'll be focusing on see uh, i uh, i am for the asia uh, group regional group so uh, the experience which i had is like uh, countries like pakistan afghanistan kazakhstan all those sides and come this side bangladesh and burma myanmar all these are uh, very few uh, women in geo special are uh, there and uh, at uh, undergraduate level and uh, in the universities they do have some course but uh, for polishing their skills and other things they don't have any opportunity and uh, again if you go to that island countries like vietnam and uh, some small islands are there and uh, so they are also the same problem but once the things are available they do take it so i had lot of the maximum participation was from philippines and i didn't expect that slowly slowly i could pull from pakistan the neighboring countries nepal also is very few i mean <clears throat> though there are uh, some big big uh, companies like ic mod and all they do uh, give preference to train women but that is very uh, small effort so in this way uh, and right now so you can see that uh, problem in afghanistan has started so even earlier the women there they had uh, come out and they had started understanding geo special and were really working also but at present i don't know the about the situation and then so so th- uh, this moment i want to have a representative from each country so let my effort uh, bring that it to practice thank you lakshmi and this is a good segue as well to the next topic of mentorship and developing women in tech talent i would like to invite jennifer to give her views so what advice would you give to girls and women with regards to a career in stem and we also talked about imposter syndrome and you had some advice from your mentor as well which you share with us yeah i'm happy to to share that i think especially for um women when they go into more technical roles or into an environment that is perceived as to be more technical i think often times um there's a lot of self doubt that creeps in and um i remember when i was coming into the role and i was having a lot of doubts of um for myself i talked to one of my favorite uh professors at the harvard business school who um really gave me a, a lot more insight into um overcoming quote unquote imposter syndrome and one recognizing that everybody has it i think is the first step so um what i found shocking was that uh somebody that i looked up to who was one of the best in my mind one of the most popular one of the most um uh, amazing professors at at HBS uh, he said you know Jen you know even i have imposter syndrome and i was like what do you mean by that and I, like you're you're so accomplished you're you were top executive like how can you come how can you say that and he's like no actually every time i stepped into the podium and i walked into the classroom i would feel like i'm i don't deserve to be here i he's like i am not as published i'm not tenured um all of these things and he just said uh you know everybody faces that and what you need to do is you just need to keep going you know keep trying and recognize that there are a lot of things that you are also really great at and um you can't get let yourself get in the way uh and so um one of the homeworks that i got from an amazing coach i think um having a coach or using um resources like mentorship mentorship is really important uh to help help you overcome that so i i used a professional coach 
Um, and it was really, really helpful. And the advice that I would share to girls or to women that are um, battling or um, tackling imposter syndrome, uh, I'll share these five questions and one bonus question. Uh, feel free to write it down. Um, it was really helpful for me. Uh, I hope it's helpful for you. So those questions are, the first one is um, to write down and write the answer for, why am I the best person for this job in this moment? The second question is, how does this experience serve me for the better? And the third question is, why am I grateful for it? And then the fourth one is, what do I have to let go of? So these are examples of like emotions, um, caring about what other people think, um, things like that. And then um, the next one is, the last one is, what do I have to focus on right now? And so you write the answers to all these five questions. Uh, and the more you do it, the faster you'll get at, um, at kind of priming yourself with confidence to overcome this imposter syndrome. The bonus question is, what do I look forward to? And so I think it's really the series of these like six very, very powerful questions that when you're in the practice and your habit uh, of reminding yourself of all these things, I mean, you were selected for this job for a reason, right? Regardless of whether or not you had um, a master's degree or um, uh, or technical experience or not, um, I think that yeah, you just have to realize that that you can do it, and these questions will help you. And the last thing I'll say, like in regards to this topic, is also that um, I really encourage women to apply for these technical jobs. I think the difference between what men and women is that when men look at a resume and they're looking at gaps. Uh, they say, oh, well, I don't have this and this and this, but I'll still apply for it. Whereas I think a tendency for women is that they'll look at uh, a job posting and say, oh, I don't have this, I don't have this and this, and therefore I won't apply. I think that's um, inherently what will keep a lot of women, uh, will hold them back. And so I would encourage them to um, take that leap forward, know that you have qualities and you have experiences that are equally as valuable. Um, and yeah, just take the leap of faith and, and practice these questions and, and prime yourself uh, for confidence. Hope that's helpful. Thanks, Jennifer. Those are really great questions. Next, uh, Aditi, would you like to share your advice as well? Sure. Um, when I'm looking at mentorship or when I'm looking at uh, women in tech, obviously in, in my entire career or specific from a tech perspective, I have seen, and I and I won't shy away from saying that, a bit of a biased world where, you know, skill expertise in AI or women founders have had a bit more of a struggle rather than a complete playing field where, you know, they're being super successful. Obviously, there are uh, exceptions like uh, Dr. Nadeen, Dr. Lakshmi, and Shiri and Jennifer, but I think majority would would probably agree with me that you know women like uh, the way Jennifer also mentioned there are there's the imposter syndrome am I worth it am I good enough for that those those kind of things kind of pan out so when I'm looking at um, how these some of these things can be resolved and I do this at a personal as well as in my own career I have a daughter who's a teenager and she's a core STEM person in her school in Singapore. I always feel knowledge begins at home, that confidence begins at home, and I think we need to drive that. When I have conversations with her and when she's attending symposiums on AI or places where she's talking, I feel really blessed and happy that the world she's living in is actually a very, very diverse world where a lot of women or a lot of girls are in her class, majority like 55 plus would be women and they continue. And these are the girls who are actually taking STEM careers as their next move after, I mean, my daughter is in grade 11, so she's, she's, she's old enough to kind of seek that out. And I think kind of walking her journey and just keeping her fairly positive as a mom, right with the learning starting at home, I hope I'll be able to make a difference with the first person starting in, in my life, right? So that's more on a professional level. I'm a non-engineer, right? But I hope, you know, even if she's not an engineer, but she goes into a tech field, she carries on that confidence that she can make a difference. On a professional level, um, 
based on a, a lot of things that you're hearing with all the wonderful women around here, it's, it's very interesting to say that more than 60% of my team here at Foursquare, we are women. So it, I take a lot of privilege. We actually have a very diverse set of women who are in sales, more on the business side. We have women who do operations and, you know, they may be from a technology side, right? And entirely, even in Foursquare as an organization, we are putting an immense amount of effort in gender diversity, right? So obviously, if you're in location, location data and technology, it, it gets a very, very, it takes a very interesting shape and form. So I'm just hoping all the efforts that we are putting in will, will kind of be reaping results in a short term. It's just that it all has to come from us, we being women in, in kind of, you know, in leadership roles and kind of just driving this change very, very actively. In terms of, you know, just, just rounding this off when we are talking about um, what, you know, what, how can we be developing uh women or women who are actually coming into uh, the, the tech world. Um, I think it's all about the fearlessness attitude. I think it's just having the right attitude, staying very motivated. Some of the points that Jennifer articulated so well, you know, when she was talking about the questions. Um, and most importantly, where I feel uh, we should continue to do is our learning should never stop. So if we are in a specific job, and we are just learning about the job. I think going three steps ahead and just making sure whatever you believe in, you are learning and enjoying it just so that you always have that over edge in terms of where the world would be shaping and growing. So that learning aspect or that educational aspect and whatever you do in tech is, is fairly important and you have to be fairly passionate about it. So I think if, if we are able to achieve some of these things from a personal as well as a professional front, I think there would be a lot of needles we would be able to move to transform ourselves into um, not a gender biased, but an equal uh, level of men and women uh, being in STEM or being in, or for being women being in tech. Thank you Aditi for sharing. Uh, we would like to also welcome um, questions from the audience. Uh, just place the questions in the Q&A box and we will attend to them shortly. So moving on to Shiori, we would like to hear from you. How's the scene like in Japan for women in uh, geospatial careers and women in tech in general? In general, currently it looks limited here in Japan. Yeah, to be honest, I didn't know about the activities of women networking in geospatial. So the opportunities like workshop and training for women, yeah, are not common, but should be, yeah, should be known in Japan. Uh, geospatial plus is, yeah, wonderful activities, I think, and hope it will be more popular for us too. And I do a webinar speaker at Synspective. It's mostly organized in Japanese and English and open for anyone. So this could be contribute to encourage women to get to know geospatial solutions. Yeah, you, step by step, yeah. Hope we could, yeah, get network. Lasmi, would you have anything to add? Yes, Shuri. Uh, please do pass on about uh, Women in Geospatial Plus. I had one or two representations from Japan for the master class. So I'm happy, but uh, uh, it would be better. You know much better where to uh, approach. And uh, you can tell them about that uh, we are a platform where we encourage young young girls so it would be better thanks yeah Thank free you, data is available online so we can yeah start training with the data yes the young generation do does need encouragement and a platform if we give them a platform you know to speak and to learn i think uh, we are doing our part thank you Lakshmi. thank you shuri so open up this next question to all the speakers. What inspiring leadership experiences have you experienced or seen 
COVID or non-COVID related? Perhaps Jennifer, would you like to start? Sure, I, I think um, I'd start with like a COVID observation uh, or a theme that's been coming up for, for us. I think um, one of the big uh, learnings that I had was that at the end of the day, it's the people that matter. And what I mean by that is um, during this, this last few months, uh, a majority, a, a good chunk of our team is based in India. And um, when the cases uh, for COVID were spiking and a lot of their family and friends, even if they're based in Singapore, if their family and friends are based in India and they're uh, hearing about loved ones passing away or you know, catching COVID, it's really hard to expect everybody to be running at all cylinders, uh, to be um, churning out the same level of output or being able to focus at work um, uh, at the same level as when everyone's doing okay. And so one of the things that was important was for us to recognize that, hey, uh, it, it really is important to check in on, on our teams and to give them that space to know that, hey, um, we care about you more than uh, just as, as, a, as a program manager. We care about how your family's doing. And if you need that time and that space uh, to check in um, and take care of your mental health, take care of your mental health, but also take care of, of your family, uh, let us know in advance and uh, just check in with us so that we can um, do the load balancing as needed, but to really be there for each individual um, as they're going through this crisis together. So I think that's one of the biggest takeaways is that um, before, you know, checking in for the all the technical details, did you deliver this, did you deliver that? It's really um, making sure that we recognize the humanity in all of us, especially when we're going through um, a global crisis together. That even if they're, if, you know, we're, we're a remote teams that are working in different continents uh, or different countries, at the end of the day, uh, we still share concerns about our loved ones and our families. And so let's respect that. Let's take care of each other. And then uh, at the end of the day, the output will be far, far greater. So that's that was one of the learnings I have. Thank you, Jennifer. We have a question from Sumit from the audience. Um, his question is about working from home. How has it affected your work-life balance? And has it been positive? Um, it could be that women are bearing more of the household chores, or is it balanced now these days? I don't know. Um, what's your experience like? Maybe you want to share this? How do you balance this working from home? Are so I think, yeah, so I think this is this is a very interesting one because there have been times, uh, I'll tell you when I when I had just started with the uh, Foursquare, obviously majority of our business ops people or the people that we work with are based out of US, right? And we have a smallish team in Asia. So we're working on a different time zone. And uh, I think since the past one and a half year, initially I just started off with one laptop, one room, and I used to do my emails. And slowly and slowly, I think what difference it's made is that entire desk has converted into like three different stands and you know a mic and a spotlight and everything. <laughs> so that's 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 how I think we all have adapted uh, to the environmental change. But I think in 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 a, in a much more on a much more serious note. Uh, it has affected work-life balance. I wouldn't say uh, that it's not, primarily because when we used to come to office, you get that social interaction. So you do step out for that one hour of lunch. You know, you meet your team for you know dinner, or you go out for client meetings. There is an element of socializing. No matter what, humans are social beings, right? And now, and we need to strike that balance. But now, when we're obviously you know, this this geospatial festival, this should have been happening in person. <laughs> That's the kind of connection and networks we would be building. But uh, at least we have a choice now is the way I would say it. So I would say it in a positive manner. But yes, it has affected uh, work-life balance because you're just not always able to turn it off that, okay, this is done. It's 6 p.m. I need to go for a run and, you know, I need to have dinner after that and there are 25 other things. Sometimes there is just no stop. You sometimes just get so caught up and railed up into things because works keep panning. And that's when, you know, things like mental health issues and 
you know, these are some of the things you really need to manage. And it's just gotten smoothened up now. After, initially, it was difficult, but now, now I think all of us are nicely and beautifully flowing. Business is kind of coming back. It's back on track while COVID still exists. So it's just been um, in that way of doing things. Thank you very much, Aditi. What about yourself, Nadine? OGC is, has so many members globally across all time zones. How does your team and yourself juggle that? Uh, with difficulty <laughs> and with passion. So I think I'm, I'm with Aditi. So two things happened. I think I appreciate the question, Sumit Hai, by the way. Um, uh, two things happened, I think, for me. One, being at home. So I have the additional challenge of being a single mom. So you don't have the additional help. Um, and But for the first time ever, I was with my two boys, ages nine and 14, all the time. And I could actually listen to what they're doing in class. And that was amazing. So I was able to actually sit down with my son in his Spanish class, because I've always wanted to learn Spanish and actually pick up a few words, right? I would never be able to do that if, it, if he was actually going to school. And then you sort of learn a little bit more about their personalities in class because they're different people in class. They're not, you know, <laughs> they deal with their teachers. So it was interesting, like living together and seeing how they, they do school. The time zones, you can see, you know, it's like past midnight and this is, um, this is a usual occurrence, right? Because we're, we're very global. It's not just OGC. I think we're all just global these days and um, we're all passionate. And so we want to be here and we want to do this and we want to connect with, you know, with our, with our, you know, uh, colleagues in India and we want to connect with our colleagues in Europe. So you find that the days are just much longer because you start in a time zone and you end in a totally different time zone and you cross two in the middle. So between literally like Australia to India, Europe, US. And that can get intense, right? Uh, but we're also doing it because like Aditi said, we're social and this is our way to connect. So we want to do it. It's not a hassle, but it also is exhausting because it's much easier to experience the real jet lag. Um, you know, I tell them I had this uh, uh, event in Australia. They were in person and I was at home. It was like 3 a.m. Uh, I'm dressed up you know my kids are asleep and they were together and they were like you know just doing this you know hey could you please scoot a little bit and i felt so jealous i'm like i'm sitting here in this dark room and you guys are together i want to be with you and i think that's what that's why we're here we're really really trying to connect so hopefully like aditi said we get back to a balance and a choice at least um yeah thank you for the wonderful sharing we have a question here. Let me show it on stage. Is there a stigma over work for females in the geospatial world? In other words, do people associate manual labor with it as they do for public transport mobility? Does anyone want to take this question? Um, I can give it a quick shot. Uh, no, <laughs> my quick answer is no. I have I haven't seen a stigma over manual labor. What I see um, is actually women. Maybe they're more expressive, or when they come into a project or a business, they connect. You know, they're driven to connect. Uh, and I I. So what I'm seeing is actually they come in and they become agents of change or accelerating innovation. And that's what I'm seeing. Um, you know, definitely not like a, a stigma or anything like that. They come with energy and wanting to prove themselves. I love Jennifer's, you know, six questions. I think they come in wanting to prove, wanting me to make a change. And Geospatial is providing a, a, a very rich platform. So it's it's. It's been good from what I can tell. Uh, Lasmi and Shuri, do you have any leadership experiences that you have experienced or seen? Would you like to share from your perspective as well? Yeah, hello. Uh, during the COVID times, so most of the women or girls, some of them uh, were had lost their jobs. And most of the girls who were pursuing their career in universities, because of the closure of universities and all, they also had lacked uh, the further opportunities. 
so i had this group of girls who were deprived of the opportunities during this period i would say so they were looking for some uh, alternative or some that is where the mentorship uh, program had played a very major role during the covid times and uh, now also uh, the uh, job aspect is still there many are not finding job uh, because of covid or because of uh, some uh, connecting uh, issues so this has been uh, the problem which i had seen among my uh, in my group so let's hope for the th things to get better and let's hope that they again come back to the normalcy so till that time uh, all this mentorship program or uh, this master class the main aim of master class was that only to uh, get people uh, refresh themselves about the latest trends what was happening in and around the geospatial world so uh, this is what i observed in my group thank you lasmi and Shuri, did you have any uh, female or male mentors um, in your at the university or at your place of work as well? Many times, um, <laughs> unfortunately, um, I, I I couldn't find at this point. But um, my COVID-related experience is one of my friends. She developed the platform to show the number of infected people on map and calculated region by region. Uh, yeah, COVID topic is well, familiar to everyone, especially for women sometimes. So more women yeah, should get interested in geospatial tools and utilize more. Thank you, ladies. So we are coming to the close of this panel. I will pose the last closing question for everyone. What geospatial innovation or breakthroughs are you most passionate and excited about? What is the biggest geospatial challenge that you like to see solved? Perhaps we can start with Jennifer. Uh, Jennifer, you're on mute. So we can't hear you. Mr. still on mute. Okay, maybe we can start with you first. Would you like to start? Sure. Um, I'm excited about geospatial space. More importantly, I think in terms of innovation, when we are looking at uh, geospatial data, in, in my opinion, is obviously very crucial for clean and smart transportation. Uh, why does it really matter? Because the way I kind of look at it is obviously doing a job with a purpose. Um, carbon emission has doubled in the past decade, and there is a need by the government or the industry to reshape how the cities function, right, in terms of just kind of uh, bringing down or having low carbon economies, right? And when we are looking at how these cities function, location data is obviously a very fundamental need to kind of build these smart cities or clean smart transportation within them. So I think that in itself, uh, there is gonna be a lot of disparate data set in there, which has to come in place. But I think that's one breakthrough or an innovation where a lot of economies, a lot of governments have started putting in a lot of attention and giving that importance to location data uh, for a great future. Thank you, Aditi. Lakshmi? Yes, as an environmentalist, I will always look towards safeguarding forest, wildlife, and biodiversity. So I look towards geospatial uh, technology in helping me to protect all those things. So each tree, whichever thing has been mapped, like forest or water or land or air or everything, that should be protected just because it has been mapped. So one uh, in one of the conferences, I came across a research fellow who proposed the idea of every tree having a passport, you know, every tree having a passport, and so that all the details are uh, mapped. And accordingly, whatever is deficient or whatever parameter is lacking, that can be taken care of and it can be protected. So it was a wonderful idea, and I hope uh, even the same case with the wildlife also, 
uh, if it, it can be mapped and if we can provide them a uh, proper home ranges and proper bypasses also just in case of uh, uh, in the big cities or if some infrastructure is coming up if we can provide them a proper corridor for their uh, survival then it would be a wonderful thing i look much more towards uh, safeguarding the natural resources thank you lakshmi shuri yeah um one of the geospatial innovation i think is yeah gps services uh, gps uh, people can easily access the GPS information and use the data for daily life and fun, not only for academic and intelligence purposes. Um, I, I work in satellite Earth observation sector, so let me share about this. And um, these days, more and more commercial players are getting involved in this industry. So more and more satellites will be launched in space and the data will be more yeah, familiar for us. Yeah, one of the challenges at this point is data availability and accessibility. In these days, yeah, price is not affordable for, for everyone. But yeah, by increasing the players, commercial players are participating in this industry, it the data and the solution will be yeah, more yeah, accessible and issues and problems will be solved with the data. That's an yeah, exciting point for me. Thank you, Shiri. You try again with Jennifer? This is working now. Okay. Yes, it is. Perfect. Uh, I, I would say for me, I, I'm super excited about um, uh, augmented reality and things like indoor navigation. I think those are the things that are, are to me, really, really exciting as we think about um, both commercial as well as uh, consumer innovations um, that can be built on top of that. So I'm really excited about that. Thank you. And Dr. Nadine? Yeah, I, I love what Sherry just said. So honestly, there are many challenges out there from climate change and pandemics that we talked about. I, I feel that uh, we're getting too excited sometimes about the new and shiny stuff, digital twins and new space and the metaverse, but we're still not integrating all this data fast enough to prevent or respond to flooding and wildfires and landslides and we are wasting billions of dollars on underground infrastructure mistakes right and i think this may be not the sexiest uh, challenge but to just try to make all this information the location information findable accessible interoperable reusable fair uh, it's, I think, one challenge that we as a community, uh, if we can get to that, then we can then build on that to create the impact that I know we can have on this world. So I would pick, you know, fair location information. Thank you very much, Nadine. And thank you to all ladies for this wonderful sharing and session and to the audience for um, joining us this Tuesday afternoon and enjoy the rest of the festival. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank, Thank you. you, Vanessa. Thank you, Vanessa. Bye.